For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Good, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Lincoln, Mayor of Stockton, California here. Uh, on behalf of the city of Stockton, I'd like to welcome our governor. Thank you for coming and joining us today and, and touring this facility. The city of Stockton is uh, proud to partner with OptumServe and also uh, the county uh, public, uh, San Joaquin County Department of, of Public Health as well. Uh, this is uh, a great uh, clinic here that was stood up on February 23rd uh, that's helping to meet some of the great needs of our community that have been dispropor disproportionately impacted as a result of, of COVID-19. Uh, to date, the city of Stockton, uh, we've been able to, uh, we've been able to vaccinate over 62,000 uh, residents, which is about 18% uh, of our population. So we are making progress. Uh, but with that, it's centers like this, Governor, uh, that is helping us uh, create more access, uh, which is again leading to that type of progress so we can continue to uh, move our community forward so that our residents can see the type of, of healings in public health and, and safety that that they, uh, that they need. So uh, without further ado, again, I, I just want to thank the governor for joining us. And I want to uh, invite uh, our assembly member representative, uh, Carlos Villapadua. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank the governor for coming into this area, our, our hometown, my hometown, Stockton, for bringing the attention to the disadvantaged communities across the state and for making them a majority part of the vaccine, vaccine rollout. These disadvantaged communities are hard to reach, but they are critical to reach. They are home to the significant portion of agricultural uh, farm workers and food and restaurant workers, those who are both highly vulnerable to contacting this virus, high risk and serious complications for the virus. We need to get the vaccines to these areas that have been hit the hardest. Prioritizing these communities is the right thing to do because they have uh, priorities as they've done for us by showing us the essential jobs in person every day this past year. The, these efforts uh, will take a lot of resources, resources that provide community outreach, education of the vaccine, needed transportation to, uh, and translators, Coordinating and receiving the second dose is necessary as the list goes on. Some of these folks may not even have access to the internet, same as the capacity of many of us do. This, this call needs to be answered by the community at large. It's going to take a grassroots effort, a network of local and, and local officials, organizations, and everyday community members. I need to share my appreciation to, to those in, in San Joaquin County who have already answered this call. Dr. Park, thank you for all your hard work. We understand it takes all of us and we need to have, we need not to shy away. To those who have already received the vaccine, share your story. Share what inspired you to get, to get it. Share, share who are you planning to hug for the very first time in over a year. Share your worries, if any. And, I, I just, and again, I just want to thank the governor. I know this has been a lot of work. I mean, this has been an unknown to, to all of us. But he's been working hard, and he's been meeting with us day in, day out. And it's, uh, it's up to all of us now to partner, to partner with us and for us to partner with you guys. So thank you, Governor. really do appreciate it. Uh, and now I introduce... Senator Susan Talamantes Eggman. Good morning, everybody. I think it's still morning, is it? I don't know. Uh, we already uh, went up to Sacramento and voted to reopen the schools. Thanks to the governor for that and all the teams that really negotiated uh, to get that done. Um, I want to thank the governor and welcome him to Stockton for coming down and, and uh, I'm standing up yet one more clinic, right? The public health has been doing a fantastic job. Um, but we know more is needed, especially in areas like this in Stribley. Uh, this was my, my council district when I served in the city council. Um, and of note to the governor, perhaps, uh, who is a baseball player, 
Uh, Stribley Park out there was uh, the home of Cal Mex Baseball, one of the longest running Mexican-American uh, baseball leagues. When Latinos weren't allowed to join a lot of other teams, they formed their own and still, uh, still running. I throw an opening pitch a couple times. Um, so just, this is just a, such a well-used place. Uh, when we went into bankruptcy and this was standing, we used this as a, as a library when we had to close our libraries. So this has always been the place, I think, of resilience, uh, of the community coming together. And this standing up this Optimum Clinic is just one more example, I think, of all levels of government trying to work together to really get out into the uh, communities where, where people live. We were able to talk to a couple of folks uh, who are getting vaccinated right now. Farm workers are in there, agricultural workers, uh, uh, the people from the Port of Stockton. Uh, all of our essential people are coming in now to, to get vaccinated. So when it's your turn, then this is when you sign up through my turn. So you go on my turn and you might be directed here um, and keep going back every single day if you need to, uh, not to get vaccinated, but just to sign up, make sure uh, you can find your spot. So I wanna thank you, Governor. Uh, we need more, we just always kind of need more. And so it's here. Come and get it. Thank you very much for uh, everyone being here today. The work of the nonprofits. I see our DA here, Maggie Park. It's, it's really taken this whole village. Uh, and right now, Governor, we welcome you to our, our village uh, and keep on coming back. And thank you so much for everything you've done. This pandemic has not been easy on in any of us. Uh, it's easy to throw stones. Uh, it's harder to actually stand up and do the work. So thank you very much and please. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for kind words. Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, thank you for your leadership and stewardship as well uh, and support for getting our schools safely reopened. Mr. Assemblymember, thank you as well for all your incredible support and advocacy, uh, not only on behalf of your community, but the region more broadly. Mr. Mayor, it's wonderful uh, to be here with you, Madam DA, Supervisor, uh, so many other elected officials. Dr. Park, thank you, uh, the local health officer, day in and day out doing uh, the real work uh, that's necessary to move us past this pandemic and get back to whatever semblance of normalcy uh, that the summer and fall will provide. I'm honored to be here as well with Dr. Galley uh, and with many members of my team, but we're here uh, with a purpose and with intention, and that is to highlight and update you on some of the progress we've made here in the state of California as it relates to addressing this pandemic, mitigating the spread of this disease, uh, and ultimately beginning to safely not only reopen our schools, but to safely reopen the economy in the state. Uh, today, we're reporting 2.1% positivity, 2.1% positivity, 3,500 cases, just bookmark for consideration the progress in the last 30 days. We were at 6.1%. 30 days ago, 2.1% today. 30 days ago, we had over 13,000 cases reported, again, to 500 cases reported. In the last two weeks, we've seen progress continue in terms of the decompression and stress in our hospitals and our ICUs, hospitalizations down uh, in terms of COVID patients being identified just in the last two weeks by 41%. 43% decline in ICUs over that same period of time. We have been all over the state of California with a focused mission on delivering vaccines. We have now, on average, over the last seven days, administered over 224,000 doses each and every day of vaccines. Over 9.5 million vaccines have been administered here in the state of California. We're well on our way uh, to getting to that 10 million mark over the course of the next number of days. 1.7 million vaccines have been administered just in the last seven days in the state of California. We are cognizant and we are very mindful that that top line number means something for some people. It means something completely different for other people. And that's exactly why I'm here today to update you and to announce a new strategy to address the issue that truly is our North Star, not a platitude, not a promise, but something we must be accountable to delivering, and that's the issue of equity. Over the course of the last number of weeks, I've been traveling to cities across this state, larger cities like Stockton, smaller communities like Arvin and Kern County. I was just down in Southern California yesterday on the Central Coast, not just in the Central Valley. We've been making announcements at a consistent basis to update everybody on the progress we're making towards reaching uh, our milestones and commitments to address the issue of equity by reaching out to communities where they are, 
not just large mass vaccination sites that are limited in scope in terms of access to people that have vehicles, people that have the ability to navigate these tools of technology and platforms like my term, but also to get into communities that have been hard hit, disproportionately impacted by this pandemic with pop-up sites, with sites like this, an Optum Serve site. Last week, we uh, began our week in the Central Valley committing to a 58% increase in week-over-week -week allocations of vaccines, 58% increase. We identified 34,000 doses that we reallocated and reprioritized to our farm workers and food workers in the Valley. We announced OptumServe would be putting 11 sites, making them fully operational in the Valley. Today I can announce that we actually exceeded that goal. There are now 12 sites with Porterville uh, moving in Tulare County and of course this site here in Stockton. All of that was important. All of that was additive to the work that we're doing with the Biden administration, the two first large scale, not only mass vaccination programs, but large scale mobile programs that are components of those two FEMA sites, one in Northern California and one in Southern California that go out into communities large and small, partnering with community-based organizations, again, focused on the issue of equity. We announced as well 337 community-based organizations that we have contracted with, some $52.7 million invested to do in-language, culturally competent, trusted messenger, peer-to-peer -peer outreach for communities that have hesitancy or communities that don't have these tools of technology, don't have access to transportation, or even knowledge about the availability and the proximity of vaccinations. Trusted messengers include navigators that were part of this program and part of our efforts. New PSA programs in language that we put out in radio, in TV, ethnic media. All of that said, and forgive me for being long-winded, all of that said, we're still falling short. All of that said, we're not meeting our goals. There's an old adage says, continue to do what you've done, you'll get what you got. And at the end of the day, we could continue to improve with these coalitions and coordinating our partners, doing a little bit more, a little bit better, but I don't think we'll truly meet the moment and we will not mark real and demonstrable progress to address the issue of the hardest hit communities that have been underserved across the spectrum and currently are being underserved in terms of access of vaccination. And let me be more precise, that disproportionately has fallen on the Latino community in the state of California. African American community, yes, but disproportionately even more so on the Latino community in California. So the reason we are announcing today subsequent efforts is we need to recognize that we have to reconcile the fact that everything we've done and we're doing as much or more than most other states in the country are not going to get us to where we want to go. We have to be bolder and we have to go bigger in terms of our resolve and our commitment. And that's the announcement today. We continue with the framework. 70% of all of the vaccinations in this state will be allocated based upon Eligibility for seniors are most vulnerable as it relates to mortality and morbidity associated with this pandemic. That remains. The 30% remains exposure factor, and that's focused on employment status, including our schools. We're not changing that frame, but within that frame, we're doing the following. We are committing 40%, 40% of all the vaccines to communities and census and zip codes like the one we're in today. This zip code is part of Stockton, but it's a different part of Stockton in this respect. It's part of what we refer to as a healthy place indexed identified community location, meaning a location where we consider 25 different characteristics as it relates to access to healthcare, transportation, 
education, issues related to environment, environmental justice, all of that is considered. And we put out a Healthy Place Index with four quartiles, the lowest quartile being the most impacted with the disease burden, most impacted in terms of health outcomes, most impacted in terms of mortality and morbidity associated with not only case rates but death rates in the state of California. And we are committing now as a state to provide that overlay in that lower quartile of the Healthy Place Index with 40 percent of all of the allocated vaccines targeted at communities that have had this disproportionate burden. That's a way we're going to make real progress as it relates to advancing our cause. This cause, I think, should unite all of us in California, and that's the cause of equity. So that's what we're announcing today. Why is that important? Well, let me just give you some stats and facts, one very simple one that should underscore the imperative of this announcement and the why we are here today making it. Just consider low-income households earning less than $40,000 a year have been impacted by two times those in households whose incomes are north of $120,000. They've been impacted by multiples in terms of the impact of this disease and this pandemic. At the same time, insult to injury, households earning over $120,000 have twice the access to vaccines than those communities that have been disproportionately impacted. That is what we have to reconcile. We have to own up to that. And by the way, I just repeat this, it's not unique to California, quite the contrary. I think what is unique is this commitment to begin to address it. We're humbled by this. We're sober by the practical application. No one's naive that you can make an announcement and all of this solves itself. This is going to be stubborn. This is going to be challenging. But we are doing something that is necessary at this moment not only to do the right thing to communities that have been disproportionately impacted, but also to safely reopen our economy. You can't safely reopen your economy until we get this disease behind us. We can't honestly do that unless we address those communities that are disproportionately vulnerable to this pandemic and its deadly impacts. And we're also not naive. When we talk about reopening the economy in so many sectors, hospitality, being the most obvious, there's also an overlay in relates to the workforce. And we're not going to do that unless we're mindful that we're asking people to go back to work, putting themselves at risk, without commensurate support to do so safely. And that's why we've created a new metric, 2 million. Not the 10 million we're likely to announce in the next few days in terms of total vaccines distributed, but perhaps the more important metric and that is what number of vaccines went to communities that have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And we have created, for purposes of moving this agenda forward, a numerical metric of 2 million vaccines that would then allow us a modest loosening of the tiers as it relates to case rates per 100,000. Now, again, none of this I wish, you know, I was Herman Cain and I had a 999 plan and everybody would get it. I recognize some of this is deeply complex. That's why I brought, we brought our doctor, Dr. Galley today to talk through some of the details. But it should be complex in a state that happens to be the most diverse state in the world's most diverse democracy. It requires nuance. It requires specific strategies. The bottom line, though, is once we meet that 2 million threshold, and by the way, we're a little over 1.6 million today, within the next few weeks, when we see case rates, positivity rates continue to stabilize and vaccination rates continue to rise, we will be in a position to modestly loosen up some of the tiering, continuing to keep the tiers in place, but to do so in a way that allows us to move through them a little bit more quickly, but safely mindful again 
of equity in that process. So that's the announcement today. Uh, we think it's meaningful, but it means nothing unless we actually deliver on this. And so moving into next week, when we anticipate to receive 1.62 million, slightly lower than we had anticipated, but the ability to order 1.62 million doses of vaccine, we're going to be doing it with an overlay that we have now advanced today uh, and hopefully doing a little bit more justice on the issue of equity. I'll close because it doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. But when you look today at total impact of this pandemic over the last year, 55% of those that have tested positive in this state have been tested positive, happen to be Latino. 46% of the deaths happen to be Latino. So when I say or rather assert that the impact has been disproportionate in the Latino community, those numbers bear fruit to that assertion. And that's why we're here to address that. And I'm grateful, Mr. Mayor, uh, to be back in Stockton, uh, Supervisor, Madam DA, incredible Senator and Assembly member, uh, to be back in a community uh, that uh, understands these things in very raw and emotional ways, because this is a community that has been impacted disproportionately and deserves more attention as we move forward. Uh, and so that broad strokes is what we wanted to communicate here today. We also put out, if you were wondering, uh, updates on mask wearing, encouraging people, particularly those that use cloth masks, to consider using an additional mask and double masking. If you're not using the cloth mask and you're using uh, masks like this that actually filter even more than N95 masks, uh, that's not the guideline recommendation, but we are encouraging people basically to double down on mask wearing, particularly in light of all of what I would argue is bad information coming from at least four states in this country. Uh, we will not be walking down their path. Uh, we're mindful uh, of your health and our future. And I'll just note, without belaboring the point, uh, that the positivity rate in those states is substantially higher than even here in the state of California. Uh, and yet we still feel very, very strongly as we begin to loosen things up and reopen our economy that mask wearing is becoming now more essential as we transition to herd immunity and broad access to vaccines. Thank you all for allowing me a little extra time of indulgence. Uh, and of course, now we're all here to answer any questions. Hi, good morning, Governor Gavin Newsom, K Reseed with KCRA3. I wanted to know, you know, you're saying that we have to be bolder, we have to be bigger. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean we're going to be uh, training more people to inoculate more people? I mean, how exactly is this going to look like? No, it means doing exactly what I said we were going to do, provide more vaccine to those that have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic, to be more focused on these communities, particularly the lowest quartile in the Healthy Place Index, to provide access by providing 40 percent of all of the administered doses uh, to those communities that have had a disproportionate disease burden. It's as clear and simple as that. At the end of the day, it means continuing to build on our community-based organiz organization partnerships, our trusted messenger campaign, our navigator campaign. I gave you an update today in terms of that work, $52.7 million, 337 CBOs. By the way, 19 that are part of that coalition, thank you for your work identifying, including, Mr. Mayor, a lot of faith-based organizations, which is incredibly important to all of us just here in San Joaquin, in the county and in the region, part of that coalition. So it means efforts along those lines and continuing uh, the incredible partnerships with counties like this. Good morning, Governor. Kurt Rivera with ABC 10 News here in Stockton. My question is, how do you build trust in communities where people are afraid of the government, especially where we're standing right now, uh, and then in the, in the fields, there are rumors going around where some farm workers fear chips are going into their arms for the government to track them or they'll be deported. 
Yeah, I've been all over the state trying to address some of those, uh, a lot of that misinformation, disinformation that's out there, some intentional, some just part, parcel of uh, a little bit of our history in, as a nation. Uh, and we're trying to address it head on. And that's specifically one of the foundational reasons we have entrusted with not only state money, but philanthropic money, $53 million to those 337 community-based organizations to specifically address the question you just posed. Yeah. To go out into farm worker communities, to have trusted messengers, to have folks that have been vaccinated, like the young man we just saw here, a farm worker, go back into his community and let folks know he's safe and healthy, and he just helped save not only his life, but other members' lives in his community. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do and amplify. In addition to that, we have done specifically 94 Spanish-speaking, that's specific Spanish-speaking, we're doing it across the spectrum, 94 Spanish-speaking radio stations we've contracted with uh, to do targeted ads. We have a third PSA campaign to do just the same. So we're trying to do this in a very granular level, reach out to farm workers directly, reach out to employers, go community by community, district by district, pop-up site by pop-up site, mobile site by mobile site, OptumServe site by OptumServe site, and have community leaders deliver that message. All right, thank you. Hi, Governor, this is Laura Diaz from the Stockton Record. Among our sources, there's been concerns within local businesses and farm workers about essential workers who don't have the time to take off and go to vaccination sites. Are there any plans for mobile clinics at locations, at the field, at the packing houses where they're working on their second season this pandemic? Yeah, we're doing that all over the state. We just now have more resources because of the announcement today to do uh, even more targeted outreach. We've got to meet people not only on the fields, in, in their workplace. We also meet people in their homes. You have homebound seniors and others uh, that we also have to reach out to. So this is a door knocking campaign, uh, not just a campaign to go out in fields large and small up across the state or to employers all across the state. So this is exactly what the announcement today provides for more abundance, more accessibility, for more mobile sites, more sites that meet people where they are, where they work, where they live. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, this is Heather Jansen with CBS 13 out of Sacramento. Um, we've heard stories, you know, of people who are of more privileged communities driving and going to these communities that maybe now will have more allocation and resources for vaccines. But is there a plan in place to stop that from happening if uh, truly equity here is the goal? No, it's, it, we are working on this. It's whack-a-mole every single day. We've had issues specific to, and I've seen this firsthand. I was down in uh, East LA the other day uh, at a public housing site, uh, exclusively uh, Latino, and saw these Audis pull up, folks that look like me, wondering what was going on. It was a pop-up FEMA site, meeting the community where they are. And what happened is there was a code that went out on the app that was shared outside of the community. So your example, your question is spot on. And we're seeing that in other parts of this state. And so we're trying to geofence that, and we're also trying to do the following. Instead of having group codes, we're now doing individual scheduled codes to make that more challenging and create more burdens and obstacles for people abusing that privilege uh, and uh, ultimately allowing us to advance our cause. So it's imperfect, I don't, I don't you know, Again, you know, my word of the year is humility. <laughs> I mean, none of this, it, this is hard, it's stubborn. And as we're transitioning through this TPA, this third party agreement, bringing everybody on to the new My Turn app, it comes in multiple waves, it just started this week. There'll be other waves in the next couple of weeks. So we're working through a lot of it. We were just talking to Dr. Park, I said, how's My Turn work? He said, well, last week, forgive me, doctor, he said, not as well as this week. And I was encouraged by that, but also mindful that it didn't go as well last week as everybody, I, I get that. And so this is, this is our work, and this is the progress that we, we all need to make, make you together. And, 
And I would not be surprised if you or your colleagues ask me that question again over the course of the next days and weeks. And my goal is to try to mitigate uh, that issue and, uh, and do everything in my power uh, to uh, address it head on. Hi, Governor. I have a couple. Oh, Ashley Zavala with Next Star Media Group. Um, I have a couple of questions. On a call earlier today, members of your administration said that there would also be possible opportunities to expand more outdoor activities in the red tier if we meet that two million threshold. I was wondering if you can get specific, possibly, and also sort of on that same note, do you have a comment on the settlement that happened out of San Diego today with uh, youth sports? I and, don't. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have enough details about the settlement, uh, but I am pleased the progress Dr. Galley and others made when we announced youth sports being able to open with modifications here in the state. We did that a few weeks ago. Uh, I am aware of the TRO temporary restraining order, uh, but not aware of the details of that settlement. Now, on the broader issue of outdoor activities, obviously that's preferred uh, default as it relates to our safely, methodically and strategically reopening the economy. Uh, but why have Dr. Galley travel here without giving him an opportunity to talk more specifically? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, absolutely, one of the focuses of our blueprint uh, refresh is to focus on what we've learned over the last many months. Six months ago, we did not realize that outdoor activities with masks on and physical distancing are as safe as they can be done. So really supporting that in our blueprint, always trying to be a state that learns first, learns the fastest, adapts to what we're seeing in the evidence. So uh, in, this, in the blueprint announcement, you will see certain things within certain sectors, within the tiers that elevate outdoor activities more than indoors. We're more and more knowledgeable about the risk of indoor activities, especially when the mask comes off. So being certain that we support those things happening a little later and focusing on those important outdoor activities. You mentioned youth sports. Our focus was on outdoor youth sports. Even when there's some contact, it can be done with masking pretty safely. So that's going to be a key feature of what we put into the blueprint, as the governor had mentioned. And oh, sorry, just a quick follow-up. Just so, when when will we hear of these adjustments? Over the next day or two, we'll be talking through exactly specifics on the on, on the blueprint. Let me just amplify one other issue uh, to to one of the questions asked. It is key. The governor mentioned getting 40% into the communities of focus. Uh, absolutely the case. But the the point of elevating the ability to protect appointments is going to be a key feature that we need to work with our community-based partners, work with our faith-based partners, just emphasizing this point that if we're going to achieve the easy to do on paper but hard to do in reality uh, goals of equity, we're going to have to target appointments and make sure individuals that live in our targeted communities are actually the ones who get the specific codes, who get the appointment blocks, and that becomes easier not just on my turn but through phone banking and other opportunities to get appointments for those who don't have the technology at hand, the time on hand to get, get uh, you, you know, sit there and refresh their browser over and over. So really targeting this effort, I think is gonna be another key piece of achieving that equity mission that the governor eloquently laid out and really is the North Star for our entire pandemic response. Uh, Governor, can we get your reaction in regards to the settlement reach today that will allow indoor sports to resume in the states, please? Yeah, not, and I just referenced it, the la it was asked in the last question. I haven't had a chance to read the settlement, so I'm, I've learned this the hard way. Uh, let me seek first to understand before you're understood. So let me, let me take time to read the details of the settlement. Forgive me. Is that it? Well, let, I mean, more over, oh. One more question. This is where you get in trouble. It's always the last question. And I'm trouble, Governor. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, there's a, a Reuters report out today quoted Chris Murray at the University of Washington saying the South African variant can, quote, dampen the effect of the vaccine and could also, quote, evade natural immunity in people previously infected. Dr. Fauci said even after vaccination, quote, I still would want to wear a mask if there was another variant out there. Hearing that, does that give you more concern about reopening the state? 
Well, it's one of the reasons we're doubling down on mask wearing and updating our guidelines as we're doing today. Um, and I want to just be crystal clear about that. If I wasn't earlier, we will be doubling down on mask wearing, not arguing uh, to follow the example of Texas and other states that I think are making a terrible mistake. And, and I, again, forgive me, but the positivity rate in California is 2.1 percent in Texas. It's five times California. It's four times in Florida and some of these states. You know, I, I, this is not the time to spike the ball. There's no mission accomplished sign behind us. We're not running the 90-yard dash in the vernacular sport questions you just asked me. So we really have to work through this next six, eight weeks, nine weeks, next 100 days till we get to that abundance frame with vaccines. We're in a scarcity frame. I, I just I want to repeat this, and I'll get to your question about variants because I have an update for you. Now, last week, we administered 1.7 million vaccines. I noted, you may have picked up, Next week, we're only receiving 1.62. So the only constraint in terms of our vaccination efforts in this state broadly for everybody, regardless of zip code and healthy place index, is manufactured supply. J&J, &J, we got 21,000 doses of J&J. &J. The state received none. It went to the two FEMA sites, one in northern Southern California, 10,500 each. Next week, we're told we can order this week. We have 320,000 J&J &J vaccines, a little less than what we had anticipated. Again, no criticism here, just an observation about the next few weeks in particular are going to be stubborn in terms of available manufactured supply. But what happens in the next few months, we need to be prepared for. And that's why we're designing a system that will allow us to administer some four million vaccines a week. We're currently doing one seven. We've actually designed one conservatively for about 2.7, but we want to get it to about four million. The mayor made the point just a moment ago, walked in, said we're ready to do a lot more. And I, that's music to our ears. That's exactly what we want to hear. And so we're designing that system, only constraint supply. When we get it, we go, and we go quickly. That allows us to move forward against these variants, against these mutations. Remember, we're not just looking at the South African mutation. We're looking at a Brazilian mutation. We're looking at a New York mutation. We're looking at two mutations, or rather variants. They're very similar, what we refer to as the West Coast variants. Uh, we, of course, have the United Kingdom. UK, over 250 have been identified in the state of California, South Africa, uh, just a few. One new variant we announced yesterday from New York and over 5,500, closer to 5,700 now, of the West Coast variants. So it is a race against the variants. It's a race against exhaustion. <laughs> it's a race to safely, thoughtfully open our economy, mindful that it has to be economy that doesn't leave people behind, that's truly inclusive. Uh, we are a universal state. Uh, it's what makes California not good, it makes us great. And, and if there's any pre-existing condition, it's the fact that we haven't lived up to our promise pre-pandemic, and of course that has been exposed to the world during this pandemic. Let us be mindful post-pandemic of our responsibility, but mindful again today of our opportunity to begin anew to address those issues. That's what we are promoting. That's what we're announcing today. A lot of stubborn work ahead of us. Wonderful to be back here in Stockton. And thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org coronavirus.